Good morning, church. We're gonna look at 1 Timothy one more time. So if you have a Bible, you can turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter six. We're on the last chapter. You heard Dane read it. You can take a Bible from the pew back in front of you, 1 Timothy chapter six. And today, church, is the last day of our fiscal year, okay? And I wanted you to know, because of people here who have the habit of generous investing, this year this church has received about $6.6 million in our general fund. Can we just thank God for that? Wow, and, and I want you to know I'm thanking God for you. And this year, because of people who have just lived out this habit of generous investing, our outreach budget has received $2.1 million this year, and I'm just thanking God for that. <laughs> and for you, so Brian, I didn't know you were gonna go on and on about being here 24 years. So I actually this morning was thinking about being here 28 years, and so I started doing my own math here, and I realized that people in this church have invested about $150 million in this church over the 28 years that I've been here, just blowing my mind. Yeah, thank you, Father in heaven. And people have invested on top of that another $40 million in our outreach budget. And I realize when I even say all of this, folks, it doesn't include uh, money that you've given to our Northwest Cares to take care of people in our body. It, it doesn't include money that you've supported individual missionaries with. I know we have people that are back here today who've been on a mission trip in Guatemala, people who are back here today been on a mission trip in Cuba, it's so great to see you guys. And, and it doesn't even include all the money that you've invested in organizations for the kingdom purposes of God outside of this church. And you know, I want you to know that that money, along with paying staff salaries, allows for this whole campus. It has allowed for many, 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 many groups to get together, to connect, to follow Jesus together, to look at the word together. And today, our passage talks a lot about investing. And I want you to know that today, this message is especially personal for me. Because I want y'all to know that Neil Tamba and Vila Tamba, our lives, and we talk about this, our lives have been marked by learning from a lot of people here who have the habit of generous investing. And, and Neil and Vila have been encouraged to experience the unexpected joy of desperate dependence on Jesus in the matter of investing in the kingdom purposes of God because of people here. And, and church, we understand today we are here because of people who for 73 years since the start of this church for people who have had this, I'll call it spiritual discipline habit of generous investing. And I also want you to know this this morning that as we jump into 1 Timothy chapter six, we're here not just because of those people, but because of some people, we think Paul wrote this about AD 62, okay? Some people Paul wrote to that day that they were generously investing in the kingdom business of God and generations after them did that and that we're here today because of part of that. And the great news here and why I wanted to share this with you to say thank you to God and thank you to you is today as we talk about money here, guilt-free, shame-free zone today, okay? That, that there's no big need, 
I have to present to you today. Really, what we're getting to do today is just to look at the Word of God. And if you're a guest here, I want you to know, here's what we do here. We just open the Word of God and we go through books of the Bible. And we just take what it gives. And, and, and the great thing this morning is we talk about this, what I really want for all of us today, that it would just feel like an invite into the unexpected joy of desperate dependence on Jesus in the matter of investing generously, okay, church? So here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna talk about three things because this is what the text brings to us today. We're gonna talk about the heart of unhealthy investments. Paul, Paul's gonna spend a bunch of time on this. We're gonna talk about the heart of healthy investments, and then I wanna talk about, as I've said, this habit of generous giving. Now remember, church, we've said this whole series uh, that Paul says the purpose of the church is this, to be Jesus' chosen building to hold the truth beautifully. Remember that? That the church actually matters to Jesus, and part of how we hold the truth beautifully is through the habit of generous investing. So let's start here. First, the heart of unhealthy investments, and I want you to see how Paul gets into a discussion about money, about power, about influence, about investing. So we're gonna start at verse three, and he says, if anyone teaches a different doctrine and does not agree with the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the teaching that accords with godliness. Now pause here. This is why I'm even using this word healthy and unhealthy. Right here it says sound words. You know that word there is hy hygiene. He says if anybody doesn't agree with the hygienic words of Jesus, we, we have a problem here. And again, I'll say this, it, it starts with leaders. Yo, know, Paul's gonna get into a discussion about money, starting with leaders and teachers and me. And one other observation we've made for a few weeks here, not all teaching is created equal, right? He's looking at leaders and teachers inside the church, and he says sometimes there's a problem, and you, part of what you do is you read your Bible, and you say, is this true to the Word of God, okay? So he says, if anybody doesn't agree with all this, he says in verse four, that person is, look what it says, puffed up with conceit and understands nothing. He has an unhealthy, there's the word again, craving for controversy. Puffed up, conceited, because this, this is a problem with leaders and teachers and people with that gift. And he understands nothing. Y'all ever hear that phrase that goes like this? What does being wrong feel like? It feels like being right. You know what I'm saying? That you can be arguing a case about some facts and realize later, wow, I was totally wrong, but it felt like being right. Paul says there are people. And, and, and they really do think they're right. And the reality is they're wrong, and they actually know very little, and this is part of the deceptive nature of pride in our lives. And he says, you know what happens with these teachers? Here's part of the mark of their ministry. They, they could sound really good, people could laugh a lot, they can think, whoa, this, 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 this man or woman, they can draw a crowd, and Paul says, listen, they cause dissensions. They cause people to have evil suspicions. Verse uh, five, we're told this. Here's the deal. They, they create constant friction among people. And then it says, here is their motivation. And here's how we get into talking about money. Imagining that godliness is a means of gain. Greed was their core motivation. Greed for money, attention, power, influence. It's why, again, every leader, we constantly have to check our heart. And it's from there, Paul's gonna start warning everybody, all of us, about the heart of unhealthy investments. So go to verse nine, where he says this. Those who desire 
to get rich, fall into temptation. Now, let me tell you, church, you know, I, I, I purpose today that I wasn't gonna do what I know I've done in the past that preachers love to do is to tell some cheesy story about somebody who was working hard to get rich and lost their family, blah, 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 blah. I, 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 I'm not gonna do that. Although I, I did meet somebody yesterday riding bikes. I, yo, I, I just, I, I promise you, I'm literally just thinking about this. And he literally, he didn't know I was gonna preach on this, he actually said those exact words. But I'm not gonna tell you stories like that. Dang it, I, it just, that, that's not my fault. Um, okay, they, they get, get rich, they fall into temptation and a snare, okay? Now y'all, I'm not a hunter. Hunter, okay, so I didn't, I'll be honest, I didn't really know what a snare exactly was until I watched the series alone. How many have watched the series alone, okay? There's a lot of education there, you need to watch it. So they drop, they drop 10 people off all over this, an island in a really rough area and it's cold and they get 10 things and they have to, whoever survives the longest gets a bucket full of money, okay? So here's what a snare is, at least on a loan. It's a, it's a wire, they make a little wire and a little loop, so then you got a hole here. They put it low to the ground so when the bunny runs through, tightens up on its neck, <laughs> you know, that's a snare. That's, y'all, that's the exact image Paul uses when he says, those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a snare. They want it gain, but they got what? A snare. And it, then it says, and they fall into many foolish and harmful desires which plunge men into ruin and discuss, dis, destruction. The word plunge is actually your drowning. And it's interesting that Paul feels the need to kind of press this. And I think because of this, nobody really thinks this is about them, do they? Let me ask a question here. How many here want to, win, want to win the lottery? Just be honest. How many here would like to win the lottery? I'm not saying, you don't have to admit if you bought a ticket or not. Just how, how many here would like to win the lottery? Now, I really want you to show your hands here. How many here have heard lots of crazy, crazy stories of people who won the lottery and totally destroyed their lives? Okay, everybody here. Now, put your hands down. Now, question. How many here would like to win the lottery? Okay, yes, me too, yeah. Because I, I, I really, I really don't think it would happen to me. Now let me say this, just by the way, most of us here have won the lottery. Right, when it comes to the life that we get to live. Verse 10, go there. For money is the root of all sorts of evil. You say, no, thank you, John Boynton. You're evaluating your teacher right now, right? For the love of money is the root of all sorts of evil. And some, by longing for it, have wandered away from the faith. Some, y'all, again, I don't think this is me. But it... Here's what Paul says. It actually happens to people. They wander away from the faith and pierce themselves with many griefs. Do y'all know the word pierced is this? It's the bunny you caught in the snare on a spit being grilled in its own juices. That's, that's literally the picture here Paul gives. If that's not enough, Paul takes some more jabs at the heart of unhealthy investments. Go to verse 17. As for the rich in this present age, most of us here, charge them not to be haughty. Y'all, the word there literally means to be high-minded. It's about having an air of superiority that this is, Y'all, this happens all the time, right? That you have, if you have a little more money than somebody else, you actually think you're better than them. That if, if you think you judge the world's 
um, issues a little better than somebody else, you think you're better than them. If you have a little better clothes or a little better this or that, this is part of the deceptive nature of the love of money. First Corinthians 4, 7. Yo, First Corinthians actually is a great book to read on a study on pride. And maybe we should do this sometime. But to this idea that I feel superior because of what I have, Paul says, what makes you different from anyone else? What do you have that you have not received? If you did receive it, why do you boast as though you did not? Hey, um, if you've got two arms and two legs and two eyes and two ears this morning, guess what? You, you, you had them because God gave them to you. And in fact, if you are able to have a really good job, there's something about the time, space, dimension, history that you were born in that you had no choice over, that God actually supernaturally ordained that from the beginning of time. This is something about the job you have and the wealth you have, amen? And, and we only say this so we would fight this idea. Verse 17 also says, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches. Here's another part of the deceptive nature of wealth is that we think possessions guarantee life and security. Now I know, again, I don't need to explain this. Apparently we just need to be reminded because it comes up so often in the scriptures. Proverbs 18, 11, let me show you this one. The wealth of the rich is their fortified city. They imagine it an unscalable wall. You know, this is why, church, we all need to do a little Swedish death cleaning. How many here know what Swedish death cleaning is? You haven't read The Gentle Art of Swedish Death Cleaning? That's a book, and basically Swedish death cleaning. I learned this from my kids, you know, because they're looking at me getting old. Um, it, it's, it's basically this. You just start getting rid of your stuff now so your kids don't have to do it for you. That's a miserable job, right? And, and so my daughter, Natalie, loves to organize people, and so she comes over our house, and she's gonna work with, on me with my closet, right? So she, she pulls something out of my closet, and she does a Marie Kondo on me. She looks at me and said, Dad, does this piece of clothing here give you joy? To which I said, yeah, that gives me joy. So she puts it back. She pulls out another piece of clothing. Dad, does this give you joy? Well, not exactly today, but in the summer, when I go to Colorado, it's going to give me joy. So she puts it back. She pulls another piece of clothing out. You see how this goes, and we don't get rid of anything, because it's all giving me joy. <laughs> but Natalie knows something. Natalie knows this. One day, I'm going to die if Jesus doesn't come back first. One day I'm gonna die. And you know what's gonna happen? Natalie and Cherie and Stephanie and grandkids are gonna go to my, into my closet, they're gonna look at that junk and they're gonna say none of this gives us joy. And then they're gonna do two, three, four weeks of very hard labor getting rid of all my junk that is no longer giving me joy. And the point is this. The heart of unhealthy investments. We take a look at our heart and we say things like this. What, how's pride affected me? What am I holding on to? What do I really think is going on here? Where is my greatest joy? So let me go to the heart of healthy investments here. Y'all, verse six, Paul says, godliness with contentment is great gain. The word contentment during those days was a word for sufficiency. I'm a sufficient person. Paul uses that word to talk about God, sufficiency. The idea of contentment when Paul talks about it is this. I have a confession in my life that goes like this. God, you alone are the source of all things. And God, ultimately, you alone provide what I need. And God, you alone are the one I am looking to, 
to give me security and all those kinds of things. So Paul says in verse seven, for we brought nothing into the world, right Texans? We came in naked and we cannot take anything out of the world. Do your Swedish death cleaning. Don't make your kids do an estate sale, right? Verse eight, if we have, y'all this one's kind of hard here in Dallas, let me just say. If we have food and clothing with these, will we be content? If we have food and clothing, right there, there's your foundation for contentment. Now, again, although we might not think we wrestle with this, it's fascinating that Paul turns to Timothy and he believes it could be a real issue for Timothy as a leader. And look what he says to Timothy in verse 11. But as for you, O man of God, you flee these things. What he's talking about, the heart of unhealthy investments, the pride over money, this idea that my life is wrapped around in that. He's, and then he says, you do this, you pursue. Y'all, you know what this word pursue here is? That's when you're going after and you're hunting the bunny. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. Fight, fight. The word is agonize. That, that for you to have a heart that is locked up in this idea of healthy investing, you've got to pursue, you've got to fight the good fight, that you're trying to take hold of eternal life. Do you hear these words, how intentional they are? And I know in First Timothy, man, there's so many words like this, you might be like, wow, Neil, you're making the Christian life sound like a lot of work. And it actually does take some effort in the power of the Holy Spirit, and I want you to see what Paul's gonna do every time when he's actually encouraging Timothy and encouraging us, you've got to get in there. And ultimately says, and you've gotta look to Jesus. Look at verse 14, where Paul says to Timothy, listen, keep the commandment unstained. He's talking about all that he's been telling him. And free from reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's interesting to me here when talking about money. One of the things that Paul has to keep reminding people is Jesus is coming back. Do y'all believe that? Do y'all want that? You can clap. Do y'all want that man? Come Lord Jesus. Come today, Lord Jesus. Y'all, Jesus is coming, and so let me just put it this way. The heart, the heart of healthy investments is your relationship with your giver, amen. The, 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 really, at, at the core of this, the heart of healthy investments is your relationship with your giver, who's coming back one day. And, and I wanna say something about Paul here. It, and, and I hope it encourages you to go back and read First Timothy. I feel like Paul gets a bad rap in our culture. He gets a really bad rap about his views of men and women. He gets a bad rap of he seems kind of like just a hard prophet. He gets a bad rap. Sometimes people act like he's all head and no heart. What you're gonna see here, the third time in First Timothy, for the third time, Paul is talking and he's challenging and he's challenging and, and he starts thinking about Jesus and he literally just starts praising. It, it would be like if I was up here preaching and all of a sudden I just said, hey, will y'all just sing a hymn of praise with me? And the worship team would freak out. You know, but, but it's, it's, it's like that. He writes this little poem and I want you, so I want you to see it because I want you to hear the heart of healthy investments is your relationship with your giver. Look at verse 15. In the middle of this, Paul goes, oh yeah, Jesus, who is blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You, you want someone who deserves all of your investment? If verse 16, who alone has immortality. You wanna to give to one, invest in one that's gonna last forever, who dwells, verse 16, in unapproachable light. You wanna invest in something that will not lose its shine. You know, a car, it fades. Your, my latest poncho shirt, one day I know that it will get wrinkly and faded. Um, who no one has ever seen or can see, to him be the honor and eternal dominion, amen. The heart of healthy investments is your relationship with your giver. And look at verse 17, speaking of this relationship. 
where he says, the wealthy, the people who have some money, they need to rest on God who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. Now, I wanna make a comment here before I jump into this habit of generous investing. You notice it says, God gives for us to richly enjoy. So hear me say, no shame, no guilt, no big deal I'm asking you to give to today. In fact, what I really hope is that you go out and really enjoy your lunch today. You go spend some money and really enjoy your lunch and you would really think about every bite you take. Oh yeah, this is from God. This is about my relationship with him and you would enjoy it, okay? That's part of God's view of what he's given you. Now, I wanna talk about and end with this idea, the habit of generous investing. If you go to verse 18, it says, they are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share. Hey, let me tell y'all why I even say the word habit here. I, it wasn't just because I thought it was kind of cool to have H's, healthy and habit and all that. It's because there's actually three infinitives in the Greek there. They are present, active infinitives. The idea is this, it's about an ongoing stance in life. It's about a habit. It's about even when I go enjoy my lunch today, that my eyes are open to the world around me and to the kingdom business of God, and I'm thinking about how can can I be rich in good works and be ready to share and invest in long-term stuff? And that I'm constantly thinking about how am I gonna do this? Now, somebody here is gonna say today, so, okay, Neil, how much should I give, right? And so I just wanna do a little aside and be really practical here. If you've been around church or even church people at all, you've heard this thing called a tithe, 10%. The idea comes from the Old Testament. It's actually maybe a, a, a good starting point. But, but hear me say, the heart, the heart of healthy investments is about your relationship with the giver. And for some people, that's a real possibility and more and some people it's not. But, Speaking of the heart, I wanna tell you in the New Testament, I think there's a greater idea that, that goes like this. Paul said in 2 Corinthians, he said, okay, just think of it this way. If you really wanna do a, have a habit of generous investing, he says this, he who sows sparingly will reap sparingly. He's talking about money here, okay? So if you don't want much return on your, you know, what you're doing with your stuff, just reap sparingly. And then he says this, and he who sows bountifully will reap bountifully. Like if you want a big, big return in the kingdom business of God, then you do all that you can. That's the idea. And since the heart of Generous investing is really coming out of a relationship with the giver. The next verse, in verse seven, he says this. Each one must do what he's purposed in his heart. Not grudgingly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. This is why I even talk about unexpected joy here. That you, this is not simply, um, if the preacher gives a message on investing, giving on money. I feel a little guilty that day. I pull a 20 out of my pocket and drop it in the box in the back. You can do that. Uh, but, but somehow what, what, what Paul is saying, here's the New Testament idea of investing. I've thought about it. If I'm married, I've talked about it with my spouse. I've thought about it. We, we, we're planning for it. We're thinking about, whoa, if this is what we did last year, what could we do this year? Because we just wanna have tons of joy and, and, and tons of return. Th that's the idea, okay? Now, I wanna just look at verse 19 because it's got a good little warning for us. Um, how many have watched Shark Tank, okay? You watch Shark Tank. You know, there's a basic question that all the investors on Shark Tank ask every time, right? What's gonna be my return on investment and how soon am I gonna get it? So let me just remind us, church, in the kingdom business of God, verse 19, he says, you do this 
thus storing up treasures for themselves as a good foundation for the what? Future. There is a future aspect to this. So that they may take hold of that which is truly life, that somehow the present aspect is us experiencing the joy and understanding of what it means to have life in Christ. Got it? The habit of generous investing. I didn't tell you exactly how much to give, did I? But here's what I hope for all of us. This is an invite to the unexpected joy of desperate dependence on Jesus in the matter of having a habit of generous investing. Now, I still have some time left, so I just wanna share with you some really good stories at the end of the year. Some of you know some of these stories, some you don't, but I just wanna remind you about our investment in the kingdom business of God to refugees in victory. Do y'all, do y'all know how we kind of got this victory idea going? It was about 455 people who were in our small groups. We helped our small groups have discussions about what is God calling us to do. This is during our missions trip to victory recently where people came and they had the Burundi drummers who you saw. So. We decided on this. We were working towards having this community center and we realized this church, we needed $500,000 more in our missions budget to do this. Now, for years this church had been generously investing $1.1 million in our missions, which for me, I just thought that was unbelievable. Blew me away year after year. The, The year we decided on this focus on Vickery, We said, we need $500,000 more, but we're not gonna go beg the body for it. We're just gonna talk about it during our missions conference. And and as a team, we said, we're not gonna say we need $500,000 more. We're just gonna tell people what we got last year, 1.1 million. That year, $1.6 million came in. God just affirming it. Y'all, here's a picture here of an Eritrean church that meets there. I've preached there, that's part of your generous investing. This next picture is a picture of our African Missionary Fellowship that you've heard of. These folks, unbelievable, this this is part of that investing. Uh, Here's a picture of a Burmese church. Y'all, we've had about four Burmese churches that have met on this campus different times. I just want you to know what's happening with your generous investing. This is two years ago. There's me in the middle. I'm not Burmese, Um, but that's me in the middle. And um, two years ago, this particular congregation went to East Dallas with the help of a brother here. They bought their first building. Pretty amazing, huh? I wanna, y'all, I wanna show you a few guys here. There's a picture of four men. So these four guys, they were part of this church. They went to seminary, and now um, Aaron Armstrong with his hands up. Aaron Armstrong is a pastor of a church here in Dallas. Brian Newby in the green shirt is a pastor of a church in New York City. I just got a deal from him the other day talking about somebody in New York. He came to know Jesus and Brian was so pumped about it. Reese Woodruff, he's a pastor now in Washington State. And there with the um, big family, Matt Klingler and his wife, Courtney, who this church sent out 10 years ago to one of the most unreached places in our country, Silver Spring, Maryland. He and I talk all the time. He, he, you know, he's talked about how hard it is. They've been seeing people come to know Jesus and how once a church just dies out, the government actually buys that land and scrapes the place and it will never be a church again. Two weeks ago, after 10 years of trying, they put a contract on this building. Yeah. A lot of generous investing by people in our body. I, I, wanna, sh- I wanna show you a picture of one of my heroes, okay, y'all? How many know this lady? Raise your hand. Vicki Kraft. There's a lot of people here who don't know Vicki now. You, you, you gotta understand, through the habit of generous investing of women here, of men here, of people here, you know, Vicki Kraft started women's ministry. 
Uh, like, people point to her as the pioneer of women's ministry in the world. Because some people, did you enter some vesting? I got time for a couple more stories. Oh, can you bring me that? Y'all, this is so cool. Y'all remember Wayne Walker from Our Calling coming up here and um, preaching for our World Passion Week? They had a 15-year um, anniversary two weeks ago. They had a founder's banquet. Wayne asked me to come MC. I said, sure. I didn't know. Wayne gave us this award, y'all. And this is, it's called the Pioneer Award. And I wanted to show you this because he gave it to me. I'm like, shoot, I'm just here with y'all. And, and let me tell you what this is about. A lot of people had this habit of generous investing. And we were doing um, homeless ministry with a guy named Rip Parker. We had these buildings out here. And we would use our kitchen because we have it because of the money you've invested. And, and Wayne... Um, when he was a seminary student, he worked here. I said, Wayne, come do this with us. And Wayne, just in front of everybody, said, yeah, the reason there's our calling is because of Northwest Bible Church. Because of your generous investing. Amen, church. I, I wanna, yeah, amen. Let's thank God. Yeah, I, I, I wanna say something about our uh, recovery ministries here. We have a thing called Celebrate Recovery. We also have uh, re-engaged for... Uh, married couples, and I hope whether you think you're desperate or not, you would utilize that. We have this thing called Seven Pillars for people with sexual addictions. And you know, when, when our family was dealing with drug addiction, we had a ministry here called Celebrate Recovery. And I'm gonna tell you, it wasn't because staff thought of it or were running it. It was just some people who had this habit of generous investing. And one of the things they would do is they would send people to California every year for um, Saddleback. Saddle they had the training because they started it, okay? So they send Veal and I on, on their dime, not our dime. Because of their habit of generous investing, we go out there and we hear of something. They say, if pastors and wives, if, if your family has a problem, we're creating these groups where pastors can sneak off from their church and go get help. Uh, you know what I've been saying, and we've been talking about this value here, God's healing over our hiding. We would talk about community here. That gave me the idea of we need to go do recovery at our church and we need to be at our church because of our value. And if Neil and Veal are going to sneak off, then I'm not going to have any moral authority to encourage you to take care of your business here. And so we, for years, have been a part of recovery here. And I'm just gonna say this, because I hear too many stories. If you've got a problem, I just wanna encourage you to come and let's deal with it. Let me say one more thing. Here, you know, I, I, you know, I wish I would like sometimes have better foresight. I wish, and yeah, you know, we have a vision here of having surprisingly start conversations about Jesus with people. And you know, part of why we have that is because of your generous investing and, and that we've created this curriculum to help us. Yeah, you know, I wish, Every time one of you had come up to me and said with a smile on your face, Neil, tell me, let me tell you about a conversation I had about Jesus. I wish I'd taken a picture so I could show literally hundreds of them today. And so I get, a, I get a text last week, or the week before last week, from a guy, he says, Neil, our 11-year-old daughter, we've been bringing her to big church. They said, we're not, we weren't sure if she was getting much out of it. We, we went on a, a trip, I went on a work trip to Chicago and I brought my family. While we were there, we got into a conversation with a homeless man and we befriended him, we talked with him, we prayed with him. While we were walking away, my 11 year old stops and says, that was a surprisingly easy to start conversation about Jesus. <laughs> And he said this that others of you have said because you understand the resistance. He said, Neil, 
Keep casting the vision. And, and what I want to say to you is keep up the habit of generous investing in church. Let's just excel still more. Because remember, one of the reasons we are here today is because of some people in AD 62 or somewhere around there who started that habit of generous investing. And one of the reasons that we're here today is because in 1951, 73 years ago, some people and people over decades just kept generously investing. And one of the many reasons Neil Tomba is here this morning. It's because of people here who say, I wanna hold the truth beautifully. And so you've had, in 23, 24 fiscal year, a habit of generous investing. Can we stand up and worship our God with joy as we close out this fiscal year?